The Roman Empire withstood war and the madness of its rulers until the stamp of Greco-Roman culture was left on Europe and on the Mediterranean world. Among those affected were the Jews, and through Jews, a new heresy spread that would transform the West. Early Christianity, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The story of the Roman Empire can be simply told. The two centuries that opened with the Emperor Augustus were a time of peace and prosperity. There were crazy emperors and murderous emperors and murdered emperors, but the empire marched on, the Mediterranean was full of ships, the roads were safe, the borders were well guarded. Greco-Roman civilization seemed so stable, in fact, that it was taken as the ultimate structure of the world. History was no longer a process, but the record of how civilization got to be so stable and perfect. And politics were not about how things should go, but how things should be kept the way they were. The third century, however, was a time of troubles, of war, of civil war until the reign of Diocletian from 284 to 305, which was a period of reorganization and reconstruction. For nearly another century, there was relative peace, but after that, everything went to pieces. The economy cracked, the provinces were invaded by a barbarian, Rome itself was sacked, and in 476, Romulus Augustulus retired to the country, the last emperor to rule from Rome over the western part of the empire. And so the end came just about five centuries after the Battle of Actium and the beginning of the Peace of Augustus. It was a remarkable run. As Edward Gibbon, the 18th century historian, wrote, instead of inquiring why the Roman Empire was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it subsisted so long. The real turning point came not in the 5th century, but way back in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, when Rome realized that she was mortal, and when the calm confidence of an earlier age lapsed into something more anxious, more uneasy, increasingly decadent. You can chart the change in the portraits of the emperors. This is a bust of Trajan, who ruled from 98 to 117 and who was one of the best emperors Rome ever had. He seems to have grown old with a sense of humor and a certain skepticism. Fifty years later, however, emperors, just like their subjects, looked sad or worse. This is a portrait of Marcus Aurelius, a Stoic who ruled from 161 to 180. He was an excellent emperor, but one who seemed to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders. From that time on, the emperors range from sad to worried, as in this portrait of Decius, to brutish, like the emperor Caracalla, 
or to simply insane like the young Commodus, son and successor of Marcus Aurelius, who rejected the rationalism of the Stoics and invoked the protection of every oriental deity in the book. Cybele, the great mother from Asia Minor, Mithras from Persia, Isis from Egypt and any other god who promised salvation or immortality. So in the course of one century, the Romans shifted from confidence and stability to anxious uncertainty. And their view of the world shifted as well, especially in religion and philosophy. Back in the second century BC, when Rome first became open to Greek ideas, the philosophy that became popular was Stoicism. You remember that for the Stoics, the basis of morality was conformity with nature. Not only one's truly human nature, but also that of the divine world order. The wise man perceived true nature and true order and conformed to them. The Romans adapted this to their needs by emphasizing self-mastery, temperance, courage, dedication. But they also learned the universal humanitarian ideas of Stoicism and their limited original notion of virtu as manliness in the service of the state. This was enlarged and enriched. The old parochial morality was broadened into a new humanism. Men like Cicero try to apply humanism to the practical problems of political and social life. Born in 106 BC, Cicero, shown here, was a Roman orator, statesman and philosopher until his outspokenness against Mark Anthony and Octavian got him killed. It was in the name of a more humane philosophy that the Stoic Seneca became the tutor and then the counselor of the young Emperor Nero until Nero accused him of conspiracy and ordered him to take his own life. And it was Stoic philosophy that helped justify a princeps like Augustus, a first citizen, that is, who would be the wise and virtuous protector of the state. The Stoics had transformed the Platonic notion of a philosopher king into the idea that all men were equal in essence, but not in ability or virtue. There were a few superior souls, like Augustus, who had pressed through to lighter knowledge, and these alone could conceive and carry out what was good and many of the reforms of Augustus reflected this conception of the exceptional man, a man with a mission who set out to re-establish and secure the balance and harmony of the world that were threatened by excess and corruption. Hence Augustus's efforts to restore the old moral virtues, to reaffirm traditional marriage, to re-establish old religious practices and the religious rituals of old Rome, this incidentally is a shrine in a sacred landscape, to train and to hone a ruling elite based on Greco-Roman humanism, whose values would still be taught in school in the 19th and 20th centuries. But this Augustan restoration which lasted a long time, ultimately proved precarious because it depended on exceptional individuals to handle an immense and overwhelming task, the governing of an empire. And these outstanding individuals were not always available. The restoration was also shaky because the culture that was offered to or rather imposed upon the lower classes by Augustus, 
This clashed with a brutishness and irrationality that was common among the lower classes. And rationality sat uneasily on the upper classes as well, so when hard times came, it proved a veneer easy to discard. Augustus tried to introduce an ascetic, elitist philosophy good for the brightest and best. These men were told that public service was their duty and that power had to be exercised only to good ends and then with moderation. But the religious rituals were too businesslike, too cool for hot periods and the philosophy was too demanding for normal people. So when security collapsed and the economy broke down, danger and death were more on their minds and in their art. Stoicism was replaced by new ideas and new aspirations. What most people wanted as times grew hard was something more personal, more accessible. And they expressed this by saying that they wanted salus, a word which originally meant simply physical health, but which came to mean the health of the soul, that is, salvation. Stoic humanism might be good for a philosopher like Seneca, but the psychotic Emperor Nero did not want to be told what to do, and Seneca's stoicism came in handy when Nero asked him to commit suicide. A century later, stoicism led Marcus Aurelius to write his meditations, but his son and successor Commodus was a crazy lout less interested in inner fortitude than in magic salvation. By that time, Roman culture was running hard just to stand still. Respectable citizens were trying to plumb the great unknown by way of seances like this one. Emperors prayed for miracles to get them out of tight spots and ordinary people relied on religious charms, astrologers and soothsayers, and lots of amulets. If you're caught in an air raid and the bombs are falling, you know that virtue or wisdom or strength make no difference and you pray for divine intervention. That's what happened as the second century slipped into the third and the fourth. In politics, in thought, in the arts, the realism and naturalism and the sense of perspective that were part of a rational attitude to nature and the world, these gave way. The more disorder grew, the less relevant rationality seemed. The more the empire cracked, the less self-discipline and self-reliance seemed to work the more doctrines of salvation offered a promise of escape. Which brings me to Christianity. Now, there are three things we have to bear in mind when we look at early Christianity. First, the cultural context of a Hellenistic world all around it. Second, the Jewish sources of the new creed and the Jewish influences on it. And third, the changes in the contemporary world between the first century when Christianity was born and the fourth century when it was recognized by the Roman state. In other words, the ways in which the world affected Christianity and the ways in which Christianity affected the world. If we begin by looking at the dominant Hellenistic culture of the ancient world, we find that it had been deeply infiltrated by Orientalism, especially as regards religion. This, for example, is a Roman figure clad in Egyptian clothes. And this is a scene from one of the mystery religions, or from a Gnostic cult, claiming to offer access to gnosis or knowledge of spiritual mysteries. 
These cults were most popular among women and among the lower classes for whom they had been greatly simplified and vulgarized. They were not new, but their importance in the Hellenistic Greco-Roman world was new. Speaking in general terms, we might describe that world as skeptical, tolerant and materialistic. This, for example, is a pillow merchant doing business in the marketplace. But it was above all, perhaps, a cosmopolitan world in which, under Roman rule, tribes and races intermingled within the same empire. In the midst of this, only the Jews really kept their identity and their uncompromising Semitic outlook. The word Semitic, remember, refers back to the Semites, a people who moved from the Arabian desert into Mesopotamia more than 2,000 years before Christ. The Hebrews were Semites, and so were the people we now call Arabs. The Jews especially were children of an idea, the idea of Jehovah, a God of supreme universal significance and power, but with whom they had a particular unique and exclusive relationship. It was this idea that kept them alive as a people through years of trial and tribulations, alive and also jealously aloof from other religious influences in the world around them. Although Hellenistic influences affected the Jews as they affected everybody else, they affected them first in a contrary fashion, by making them resist assimilation, by stirring their nationalism, and by forcing them to reconsider and reform their religious attitudes and their ethics. In the year 175 before Christ, Antiochus IV, who ruled Syria and Palestine, started a campaign designed to unify his realm by wiping out competing religions and traditions and so he prohibited circumcision and dietary laws which were central to Judaism. The Jews, of course, refused to give up their traditions. They refused to worship Antiochus IV as a god to subordinate their religion to the state. The friction got worse until it finally erupted in the bloody Maccabean revolt of 164 BC. That was so bloody and murderous that even today the French slang for corpse is Maccabee. These are coins struck by the new Maccabean rulers. As often happens, the results of the revolt went well beyond the practical issues that set it off. And in this case, the chief result was mainly that in resistance, the Jewish religion survived as a distinct and very self-conscious belief. If Antiochus had succeeded, if Judaism as such had died out, neither Christianity nor Mohammedanism in the form they actually took would have existed. But as it happened, the persecutions and the fighting produced a sort of revival of Judaism, partly as a nationalistic manifestation, partly as a search for consolation. War was hell, life was hell, and so, just to make up for it, the Jews started to think of heaven. They took over ideas of immortality from the Gnostics, and they did this partly to encourage themselves and their friends not to bow to Antiochus and to the Syrian gods. Look at it this way. If you had to choose between sticking to Jehovah and being burnt, or worshipping a barbarian god like Baal and staying alive, you could take comfort and fortitude from the fact 
that if you were burnt, you would be rewarded afterwards in eternity, which is a long time. On the other hand, if you broke your compact with Jehovah, life was short and you would be very sorry afterwards. The Hellenistic influence which was rejected by the Jews when he tried a frontal attack was, however, going to affect Jewish thought in more subtle ways through the ethical developments of Pharisaic philosophy. The Pharisees were a religious sect given to piety, earnest prayer, strict observance of Jewish law, but also to interpreting the law of Moses in the context of changing situations. Jewish observance in general centered increasingly on reading the law and the scriptures in the synagogue, discussing them, interpreting them. This was a habit which led people to think for themselves and to listen to others around them who were developing notions to be found less in the scriptures than in current thought. Belief in an immortal soul, in angelic spirits, in personal resurrection, in free will reconciled with predestination. So with one ear to Hellenistic culture and another to their inner voice, the Pharisees were going to evolve most of the socially significant ideas which have since come down to us in the New Testament. The Sermon on the Mount is a perfect reflection of early Pharisaic doctrine. For those of you who know it, here is a passage that may sound familiar. Love ye one another from the heart, and if a man sin against thee, speak peaceably to him, and in thy soul hold no guile. And if he repent and confess, forgive him. But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him, lest catching the poison with thee, he take to swearing and so sin doubly. And if he be shameless and persist in wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart and leave to God the avenging. This passage was written by Jews over a century before the birth of Christ. It comes from the testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, which was written between 109 and 107 BC, and which later proved extremely popular with St. Paul, and was probably known to Christ as well. Now, obviously, we cannot understand Christianity unless we realize that it was the product of this long development and interaction of thought and religion within and upon the Jewish people. Jesus, after all, was a Jew and probably a rabbi who followed Jewish law. And Christianity was first preached by Jews to Jews as a sort of reformed Judaism. Jesus won a considerable following among Jews, especially among the poor, until his success provoked the hostility of the Jewish establishment, which did not find it difficult to convince the Roman governor that Jesus was a dangerous radical. So the Romans put him to death in Jerusalem, probably in 30 AD. But it's important to realize that from the first, Christianity claimed to be not a break from, but the continuation and the fulfillment of the great history of the Old Testament, which promised a Messiah, a Redeemer, who would make Israel and the Jewish people triumph over their enemies. Now, the Christians inherited a lot of things from the Jews, including the Semitic sense of world worthlessness and the conflict between body and spirit. And they took over, too, the typically Jewish vision of a blinding, all-powerful God above and the abject condition of man below, 
with his overwhelming sense of sin and a passion for salvation. But this salvation could not come from anything man could do, as the rationalist Greeks might have all argued, but only from God, or as St. Paul later put it, from faith in God which in Christian terms is simply faith in the reality and value of Christ's sacrifice. However, there is one thing to remember about all this. At the beginning, in order to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew. There was no thought of separateness in Christian communities which were merely reformed religious groups within a Jewish community. We shall see how this changed and why in our next program.